Well, Razorback fans, I know it is all about football right now, but we do have some basketball news to discuss. And unfortunately, it's not uh, very fun or good news for the Razorback basketball team. We'll get to that and also some football on today's Locked On Razorbacks podcast. You are Locked On Razorbacks, your daily podcast on the Arkansas Razorbacks, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Welcome into Locked On Razorbacks podcast. I am your host, John Neighbors. I am also the host of Out of Bounds. You can catch every weekday afternoon from 1 to 4 on 103.7 The Buzz and 103.7 The Buzz. Dot com. Hope everybody had a wonderful weekend as we are now officially on Monday and it feels like one. I can tell you that, but that's okay because we have uh, plenty of things to discuss. And again, wish I could uh, come with some good news, but we are going to start with basketball. We'll get into some football, which I think is so cool, by the way, how many of you who I see in person that listen to the podcast or watch the podcast or get after me on social media or whatever it may be how you are always about basketball. It's like some of you say, hey, enough football talk. Let's talk basketball. Man, it's about to be fall. You got to relax. But no, it's great, though. It just shows the passion that the Razorback fans have for basketball. So I really appreciate it. But uh, today, it was uh, some, good, some not so good news that we needed to discuss. I know it happened last week, but we haven't had a chance to talk about it. And it has to deal with one of the transfers that Arkansas had coming in for the upcoming basketball season. Transfer guard Keon Minifield will be on a non-scholarship red shirt at Arkansas for the 2023-2024 season. He's a 6'1 sophomore from Flint, Michigan, that committed to the Hogs on April 4th over a group of finalists that included Bama, Tennessee, Louisville, Ohio State, and a potential return to Washington. He was rated as a four-star player in the number 52 overall transfer, according to 24-7 Sports. And Minifield has been on campus participating in summer workouts with the Razorbacks and is expected to remain enrolled and practice with the team Next season, uh, Minifield, of course, dazzled people uh, as a true freshman at Washington. He was Pac-12 all-freshman team, 10 points, three assists, three rebounds, and one steal per game. He also had a 1.8 assist to turnover ratio that led all Pac-12 freshmen, shot 41% from the field, 33% from three, and just a tick under the 70% line at the free throw line. So, I, I didn't like that news whatsoever, and I know none of you did either. I wish I could sit here and say that, oh, it's going to be totally fine, but I don't know. I know I was really looking forward to Minifield being a part of this team, not necessarily strictly from the perspective of scoring. Because if you look at his numbers, I mean, it's not like he's just this elite scorer. He's pretty good, but he's electric. He's really shifty. If you've seen some of his highlights, he's got a, a really great motor and a quickness to him. But the one thing that I was going to be most excited about him was actually because of Trevin Brazil. This guy is an incredible lobber. And what I mean by that is that he can throw up those alley-oops with the best of them. And I believe that's one of the reasons why uh, Eric Musselman wanted him on this team and wanted him to be a part of this team because of his ability to lob it up to Trevin Brazil when it happens so often, which we know it will this season. And uh, now it's not going to be happening. I have never heard of this in my life from hearing somebody as a non or uh, how you put this, I, I want to make sure I get the uh, terminology right. The non-scholarship redshirt, where he goes from being a scholarship player to play this year, to now he is not on scholarship, he's a walk-on. And not only can he, is he a walk-on, but he can't play this season because he's redshirting. And he's still remaining on the team. I've never heard of that. Now, there have been some chatter behind the scenes that there was going to be a player that was not going to be able to play this season that was a transfer. Some people throwing around all the names as to who it was or why it was, whatever it is, it doesn't matter. But it ended up being, of course, in this case, Keon Minifield. I think Arkansas and Eric Musselman did everything that they possibly could to try to make sure that he was good to go, to make, try to make sure that he was uh, able to participate and able to play this season if they could figure out a way around it. But it looks like that's not the case because uh, he's not going to be playing. Now, there's also going to be a lot of questions as to why, like what happened, what happened in the process. Now, I don't know specifics on what happened. Uh, I don't know specifics on if it was an issue with some with Washington or something with Arkansas or whatever. I mean, you would think, though, just again, going off on a, on a limb here, 
you would think because of this it has to do with academics. It could be not just somewhere where he's like, oh, he doesn't have grades or good grades. It could be something to where transfer wise, there's an issue there. You know, Washington may have some classes or whatnot that he took that couldn't transfer in. Uh, or there could be something to, you know, keep him from being able to get onto the team and actually play this year because Washington's making it hard. I mean, there, there's a plethora of things and a plethora of reasons as to why this could have been the case. So it, it doesn't make much sense to just sit here and speculate, but it is really unfortunate. It's really unfortunate for him. Uh, it's really unfortunate for Arkansas because, again, I was so excited to see him out there and playing, but at least he's, uh, at this point in time, going to be on the team next season. But that leaves Arkansas now. The basketball team, which seemed to have all their ducks in a row when it came to their scholarship allotment, now they have an additional scholarship available. So what do they do with it? Well, my guess is is that they already have this plan in place. Probably we'll hear about it this week. Hopefully we'll hear about it this week. But you got to know with Muss and the incredible tactician that he is, if there was even an inkling or even a chance a remote chance that there was going to be somebody who was going to be ineligible this year, he was going to have a backup plan. And I think that they're putting together a plan or having putting together a plan. And here very soon, we're going to see who it will be taking that remaining scholarship for the Razorback. So just to go through it again, I guess this comes from hogsports.com and uh, what the projected scholarship distribution looks like right now. Uh, the, the returners, you got five scholarship players returning with Devo Davis, Trevin Brazil, Joseph Pinion, Jalen Graham, and Makai Mitchell. So you got, uh, you got those five guys returning, which is crazy to me because I'm looking at I didn't realize Devo could, still has two years remaining. I guess that's true because he hasn't used his COVID year. But if he wanted to come back again next season, he could. <laughs> I wouldn't think he would, but he could. Uh, so you got those five guys back. And then you have Layden Blocker and Bayfall who are going to be true freshmen. Uh, and then the transfers, you have still Tremont Mark, L. Ellis, Khalil Battle, Jeremiah Davenport, and Chandler Lawson, the kid from Memphis. Those are the five transfers. And now you don't have Keon Minifield, who's a non-scholarship redshirt, and your walk-on still with Lawson Blake and Cade Arbogast. So that's what, the, that's what the team is looking like right now. And I still think, regardless, it's going to be a great team. I know that Muss is, again, on top of this, and he's going to make sure that they have somebody ready and rearing uh, in, in the driver's seat to take over and take care of business. But... I mean, listen, I'm not going to try to pretend either that it's like, ah, he, he made a field. Didn't need him anyways. They'll get a better guy. I don't know. I don't know if they will. It'd be cool if they did. But, I mean, there's a reason why they wanted him. There's a reason why they got him on campus and got him the scholarship. Must have really liked what he was going to do. So, it is unfortunate. It is unfortunate and uh, hopefully it doesn't uh, impact Arkansas too much because I can just see it now. Arkansas, this upcoming season, has some point guard problems. We were like, ah, oh, see, Jeff, only Minifield would have been ready to go. It could have all worked out. But the point is, Arkansas will be fine still. I, I still think they're going to get somebody in, the, in place. And I, I bring this example up all the time because I love this example where if you're looking for optimism, here you go. Just remember that Eric Musselman got Jalen Tate really late in the game. Remember Jalen Tate, that point guard, six foot five or six foot four from uh, like northern Kentucky? Guy came out of nowhere, didn't really have any offers, but late in the game, he got offered. He came to Arkansas and was a huge impact on that team. That could happen again this year. That could be the case where there's somebody out there that no one's heard of, that maybe that Arkansas has been scouting, and when they bring him in, it's going to be an impact player. It absolutely could happen. So don't freak out. Don't think everything's terrible and the world's falling down. It should be fine. I believe in Muss, but just unfortunate for Minifield that he's not going to be able to play this season. Really wanted to see that happen with him in Brazil, especially. Uh, we'll get back to the football side of things, don't you worry, here in just a second. But folks, for a championship team, it's all about making sure every player is a perfect fit, and it's the same when it comes to your vehicle. Every part needs to fit just right. So the next time you need parts or accessories, head over to eBay Motors. With eBay guaranteed fit, you you can have be sure that every part that you need fits right the first time around, so you don't have to do it a second or third time. Just add your ride to my garage and look for the green check and to know if the part will actually fit. It's really big. You know, green is good and red is bad. They'll help you out with it. And, if they, and this is another great thing because if it doesn't fit, you'll get your money back. Because just like in sports, confidence is the name of the game. 
And when you shop on eBay Motors, it's all about the game. And also with 122 million parts to choose from, you'll be back in the game in no time. After all, it's easy to bring home a win when the right parts are guaranteed. So get the right parts and the right fit and the right prices on ebaymotors.com. Let's ride. eBay, guaranteed fit, only available to U.S. customers. Eligible items only. Exclusion supply. You are locked on Razorbacks, your daily podcast on the Arkansas Razorbacks, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. All right, so continuing on with the Locked On Razorbacks podcast, uh, talk a little football now, too, which we, we dove into it yesterday. I keep saying yesterday, the last podcast about how Arkansas was picked to finish fifth in the SEC West, and I think that's going to be much higher than that. Uh, how uh, you only have one player on preseason all SEC first team. I think Arkansas will have at least two, possibly three. Um, my goal of that got talked about and, and discussed. And I gave my reasons as to why I believe Arkansas will be better. A uh, team than Ole Miss, for instance, because of the schedule. Um, I also think that with Arkansas's you know, way of playing their home games, uh, they're going up against some of the worst teams in the SEC or at least the worst teams on their schedule in the SEC are all at home. So all these things are very should be should be beneficial. I want to make sure I preface that should be beneficial, but they got to go out and take care of business. But one question though that I have probably gotten asked more so than anything from uh, interviews that I've done with people talking about Arkansas football, got asked about a lot on SEC Media Day Radio Row and in any guesswork that I was doing there. It was about KJ Jefferson and. You know, why Dan, like, how do you think he'll be better with Dan Enos? Or do you think he'll be a better quarterback next season? Uh, You know, because, hey, the wide receivers, it's a huge question mark. Uh, It could be a bad deal. Uh, You know, you got new tight ends. All these things get thrown around, which, again, it's all about your perception and your perspective more so than anything. If you're someone that is very cautious or very, like not wanting to get too excited because you're afraid you'll be disappointed. If you're one of those fans, that's fine. Like I'm not hating on you. It's just you may look at it was like anytime you start getting some praise thrown your way, you're like, okay, well, hold, wait, let's just slow down a little bit. Let's, let's look at the facts here. Let's look at uh, what could be a problem instead of just always looking at what's the good stuff. And there's some people, which I guess is more of the category I am in, where I'm like, I look at the best things. I look at the strengths of each and everything. And I put it together of why I think it's going to be really good, or at least finding reasons to feel like it's going to be really good. Because one, I think that it excites the fan base and excites me at least and gets more pumped up for football season when I start looking at all the things that Arkansas could be or will be good at and how it could make them have a really great football season. It gets me more excited. And two, I also believe that when you start looking at those strengths too, it gives you an inside knowledge of what it could end up looking like and what it could end up being as far as the ceiling like what could these individual players do or the team do uh as a success and kind of expect that like there's a different ways to look at it but when it comes to quarterback play and when it comes to KJ Jefferson I'm going to look at it from the strengths and from the positives because the negatives aren't really prevalent with K.J. Jefferson. I mean, if you really think about it, there were not many games, there has not been many moments where K.J. Jefferson has lost you a game. You know, people may bring up Liberty last year, but he wasn't healthy, and everyone knew he was healthy because he was doing things that you'd never seen before, and he was so out of character. But there hasn't been just a game where you're like, oh, yeah, K.J. lost that game. And save the Texas A&M comments too, folks. That was one play early in the game, and Arkansas still had a touchdown lead after that play. So don't miss me with that. But I love how you are able to take it to a next level with Danny Enos coming in as the OC if you're K.J. Jefferson. We all know that he's got uh, so much talent and so much ability. He's got to work on the little things here and there, and I believe Enos is going to help him out with that. And that's why if you look at some of the – like Kendall Bryles. So look at Kendall Bryles. And – uh, people may take this as, oh, you're just crapping on him now because he's not here anymore. No, I'm not bringing it that way. I'm just being realistic about it. Like, who was the best quarterback that was under Kendall Bryles, or at least he was the offensive coordinator of Kendall Bryles, to where they got to the next level in the NFL and they blew up and did amazing? 
Like, I know it's tough to get to the NFL as a quarterback anyways, and t- even tougher to be successful at it. I mean, how many QBs can you remember Kendall Bryles actually getting ready for the next level and being successful? Uh, in any teams that was he was on. I think it was, a, was it Christian Hackenberg? Is that who his name was at Baylor for a bit? Um, you know, people may bring up RG3, but that was when Art Bryles was there at Baylor. But the point is, is that I don't have a whole huge sample of quarterbacks that Kendall Bryles has put in the league or at least has helped get to the league and be better. But we do have some with Danny Nose. We do have some with Danny Nose. Because even at Arkansas, Brandon Allen was the quarterback that he coached the, for that one year, and you saw the jump that he made. And from 2014-2015, Brandon Allen was like going from being, like, what? The bottom half of the SEC quarterback to, boom, top two, top three quarterback in the SEC that year. Like, it was that much of a, of a jump. And then you think about when he gets to Alabama, you know, he had some great quarterbacks to, to work with. Now, it's not just Dan Enos is the reason why they got to that point, but he's the one to help coach him. He had the Jalen Hurts, of course, and then we know that Tua was there and, and Mac Jones was there, and they were all part of that quarterback room. And when he's at Maryland and he's been doing what he's been doing with uh, Talia Tagovailoa, I guess we'll see what happens with him as far as uh, what he does at the next level, but the upside's there. So Enos just has a much bigger sample size of having quarterbacks that he coached in a short period of time, tweaked their game, and made them better immediately. He did, I did it with Brandon Allen. I think he did it with Jalen Hurts. And I think he's going to do it with K.J. Jefferson. So I believe it's going to be a big difference. I think it's going to work out well for Arkansas, and I think every Razorback fan is going to see it very early, the differences of what K.J. can bring. And I think the wide receivers will, uh, of course, have to be a big part of it. But we'll talk about a position group that I think is going to make the biggest jump on the team here in just a second. But, folks, this episode is brought to you by Markel from Fayetteville to El Dorado and everywhere in between. Markel has been helping Arkansas's small business community for over 30 years. Markel is a global specialty insurer with a truly people first approach. And to them, insurance is more than just a piece of paper. It's a promise to help get people back on their feet. We spend a third of our lives working, so on the job injuries can be expected. You work hard to build your business, so it's important to make sure you and your employees have the right insurance coverage. Whether you're new to business or celebrating your 25th anniversary, have one employee or 1,000 employees, Markel aims to understand your workers' compensation insurance needs. Find a local independent agent to get a free workers' compensation insurance quote today at markelinsurance.com slash locked on. That's M-A-R-K-E-L insurance.com slash locked on. Markel, insuring America's small businesses since 1930. Insurance carrier, coverage, dividends, and services availability may vary by state. Markel is a registered trademark of Markel Group Incorporated. You are Locked On Razorbacks, your daily podcast on the Arkansas Razorbacks. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. All right, so final segment here on the Locked On Razorbacks podcast. Uh, the position groups, right? We were just talking about K.J. Jefferson and talking about the wide receivers and, and uh, uh, what, the, what the team's going to look like and the expectations, and that's, that's what's going to be thrown around this entire time. But I will say that, you know, there are groups that we know are going to be better overall, like quarterback with K.J. Like that quarterback room right now is better, 100%, no doubt. Better than it was a year ago. Uh, the running back room, I think, is is better just because of you got another year of development because the entire running back room is back. Now we Rocket Sanders, but A.J. Green, Dominic Johnson's ready to go. Uh, Sam Pittman talked about him and his health, and he looks like he's he's uh, healthy and ready for fall camp. And, of course, uh, Rashad Dabinian. So, I mean, you're, you got a great running back room. So it won't be worse, and it may be the same, but I still think it'll be better just because, again, like you're another year of development. Um, so there are some groups there that have potential to be better that we already know about. And it's a matter of, okay, but who makes the biggest jump? Who's the one that's going to go from this to that? Well, I think it would be easy to say the secondary. Because you're so bad last year, 100%, especially the safeties. You were so abysmal at that position and dead last in the country. Yeah, it's a little hard not to say, yeah, it's going to be much better. Cop out answer, but that's like, it's true. But it's not like, even if it's what's so bad about it is like, they could make the biggest jump on the team by far, but still be like, 
bottom half of the of the league right? just because it was that bad. So I won't use them as an answer because I feel like that's, again, just a, it's a too easy one. The position that I honestly think is going to make the, the most significant jump, jump overall, folks, I think the defensive line. Now, now, some of you may say tight ends. I get it. Uh, some of you may, you know, may go with, with the wide receiver position. That's fine, too. But I'm telling you, the defensive line, the more I've thought about it and the more I've been looking at it, they excite me. Like They excite me of what the potential could be, especially on the edge. Edge rushing is, is obviously important, just like everything else in the, in the D-line. But when you got both Landon Jackson and Jeff Coat out there on the outsides and they're bringing the heat, I think that those two dudes are going to cause some havoc for some dudes in the SEC. And not to mention, you still have plenty of depth there in, on the inside with a few guys, too, that are experienced. you got some transfers. Uh, you know, you're going to be fine there, too, and we'll see uh, you know, what that looks like or maybe who stands out the most. But when I thought about Arkansas's best defensive teams, you, know, you think about Trey Flowers uh, and what he was able to do, how much he could disrupt on a team himself. Uh, am I comparing one of these guys to Trey Flowers? I'm not going that far. I'm just saying that when you have a great defensive end, even just one, it changes the entire defense. Trey Flowers did that. Um, you know, you think about Dietrich Wise and what he was able to do. He could change a game. Jamal Anderson, back in 06, he could change a game. So if they can just get one of those guys to be all SEC first, second team caliber, and the other guy to be really, really, really good as well. Just that be the minimum. This defensive line is going to eat some people alive. Like it's going to cause some problems. And pressure on the quarterback we know is so important and so crucial to having success. Uh, I think Arkansas will stop the run well. Uh, I think the secondary is going to be improved. But can they get pressure on the quarterback? Can they get guys out on the edge to to make some moves, open up some gaps for some of the linebackers on blitzes to get after it? Like can they do those things? I believe they will. I truly believe they will. I think it's going to be a better year for them, and I can't wait to see once they get out there. Defensive line, maybe one of my favorite positions or my position groups in general, just because of the impact that they can have. And there's nothing more satisfying, in my opinion, than when you're an SEC team. And I always, again, using that 2014 team that had so many great defensive linemen on it. There's nothing more satisfying in knowing that every time that those guys are out there, they're going to get the push. The quarterback's going to have to make a really quick decision. And there's going to be all different types of movement and false starts and, uh, you know, lining up and, and, and bad news and like all that stuff, like holding calls, like that can change games. Nobody can have a bigger impact on penalties than the D line with their false starts and with holdings. You do those things, uh, you're, you're going to be in like Flynn. It's going to be a great year too. Appreciate everybody listening in the Locked on Razorbacks podcast. Be sure to like and subscribe to the podcast on iTunes or Google Play. You can also get after me on Twitter at BuzzJohnNeighbors for any questions, comments, concerns that you may have. We'll keep it going from there. Same podcast time, same podcast channel tomorrow afternoon. Have a great day, everybody. We'll see you then.